session number three of uh, seven of the series and complications in upper limb surgery brought to you by the members of the AO North America Hand Education Committee. We've had two wonderful sessions thus far and today promises to be another cracker. It's on failed soft tissue repairs, things that bother us and can really make uh, a difference to patient outcomes. And Peter Ree is gonna be leading it with a wonderful cast of uh, faculty. Um, my name is Chai Mudgal, and uh, I've had the honor of being the chairman of this committee for the last couple of years. And I'm going to take this opportunity to invite each and every one of you who's attending to join us for the seventh annual Jesse Jupiter International Hand Forum, which is being brought to you by the Massachusetts General Hospital, as well as the members of the uh, faculty on the hand service at MGH. It's going to be held on this Saturday, May 21st at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it promises to be just a phenomenal session of the all things distal radius. The faculty is top notch and it promises to be a wonderful session. And Dr. Jupiter will be there uh, providing us with his insight of experience with distal radius fractures over the last 40 to 50 years. So I hope you're able to join us. Uh, that's enough of me and Peter, it's now over to you. All right, thank you, Chai. Uh, I'll be your moderator this evening and we have a super phenomenal faculty of um, uh, surgeons who, uh, like all of us, have had complications, but their um, way of uh, evaluating and managing these complications, I think, um, will help all of us. Uh, we have Joe Gill from Brown, Andrew Miller from uh, Thomas Jefferson University, Jeff Yao from Stanford, and Jerry Wong from uh, University of Washington. Here are disclosures. Here's a content validation statement. All right, well, if you have not been on Zoom for the past three years, uh, then I'll just remind you that um, uh, please keep your microphones muted, uh, videos turned off. If you have any questions, you can use the Q&A uh, section uh, below on your Zoom uh, toolbar, and we will try to answer those real time. And if there's anything that we can discuss as a big group, um, we'll do that as well. So use the uh, Q&A uh, chat box, uh, Q&A box uh, icon if you want to ask any questions. And here's our agenda. Uh, we'll cover a lot of um, soft tissue complications do the failed thumb base uh, soft tissue procedure, failed SL repair, um, unstable DREJ uh, after TFCC, and then um, uh, failure of gamekeeper thumb or skier's thumb repair. Here are our learning objectives. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Gill from Brown University. I'm gonna stop show sharing my screen and Joe, you can take it over. Sorry, I'm unmuted now. Thank you uh, for having me. Uh, to give this talk here about failed LRTI or in general uh, thumb CMC arthroplasty with uh, some four some four of uh, tendon suspension, uh, which is currently the gold standard uh, for managing thumb CMC arthritis uh, in patients who failed conservative management. So when the incidence of failure and re revision for failure of thumb CMC arthroplasty is about 3%. Uh, typical causes associated with this uh, include proximal substance of the metacarpal, uh, progression of adjacent joint arthritis, particularly at the scaphoid trapezoid joint, and additionally at the thumb MP joint, as well as progression of hyperextension deformity at the uh, thumb MCP joint. Other causes uh, could be neuroma from a, just a surgical approach and postoperative pain associated with this and CRPS, which again, they're a little bit less, less common. Important to note that not all these are directly associated with uh, pain, uh, but these, these are features that we see in patients that show up for revisions. So this is a retrospective review out of the University of Pittsburgh, uh, where they looked at 32 patients who had a primary procedure of some, some sort to address the thumb CMC joint, uh, including things like thumb, uh, tra trapezium resection, uh, LRTI, hemi uh, resection of the trapezium, as well as uh, arthroplasty. So they had a whole bunch of different kinds of patients. Their primary inclusion criteria was pain at the thumb base in, in all 32 patients with evidence of radiographic subsidence. They all, it, uh, eight of the patients also had, were found to have hyperextension at the MP joint and 11 had symptomatic 
scaphotrapezoid arthritis uh, as confirmed with a steroid, with a lidocaine injection. So this paper is important because it kind of really, I think, highlighted the, the features of dealing with these patients and kind of making sure to, uh, when you identify this patient with thumb base pain after surgery, after having a thumb CMC arthroplasty, it's important to consider all factors that could be contributing to this pain, including the things I listed just, just a slide ago, and um, paying attention and addressing those intraoperatively and being flexible that if you identify something intraoperatively that you didn't expect, uh, such as arthrosis of the scapho trapezoid, trapezoid joint that wasn't identified to, to address that. And this is kind of what they showed here. In, in all cases, they addressed that with a distraction pending and soft tissue interposition, they included a ligament reconstruction if there was some instability identified if they had scaphotrapezoid arthritis, they perform the scaphotrapezoid arthroplasty. And in patients with hyperextension deformity at the MP joint, uh, they address that with an arthrodesis. In this series, uh, they demonstrated a 57 month follow up in these patients uh, that all their clinical parameters improved, and 82% of the patients reported a good functional outcome. So it shows that, again, if you pay close attention to each of the components that could be contributing to the uh, persistent pain and address them, patients could do well, even with the revision surgery. This is a case example from, from their series that they had, had in their study. Uh, this is a 57-year-old uh, patient who underwent orthodesis of the MP joint, uh, as well as LRTI. Uh, the patient re represented with persistent pain at the thumb, or recurrence of pain at the thumb base, uh, as well as the scaphotrapezoid joint. Uh, so what they did surgically uh, was they uh, indicated the patient for distraction pinning with allograft interposition, uh, ligament reconstruction for st to stabilize the joint, as well as ST arthroplasty um, uh, with, um, with a tendon graft. And at two years, uh, they noted, two years following the surgery, uh, they noted the patient had a persistently good outcome. Again, because all the features that were resulting in, a, in the persistent pain uh, were addressed. Uh, this is one of my own patients. Uh, when I you know, began practicing, this is back in 2019. Uh, she showed up to me a year and a half after um, a CMC arthroplasty with 10 suspension using a slip of APL. She never had any improvement after surgery from her global thumb pain. Uh, and you know, it was very apparent to me uh, that she didn't have significant subsidence over her um, Escaphotrapezoid joint was really uh, worn out. On exam, she had significant tenderness localized to this joint. I did an injection of lidocaine, and this resulted pretty much in complete resolution of, of pain. So I indicated her for, uh, I, I did discuss resuspending it if I felt like there was some instability and we can do another reconstruction with potentially like a tight rope. However, she was stable intraoperatively. And I simply performed a proximal uh, trapezoid resection. Uh, here clearly, I was a bit a bit uh, over eager on getting into the capitate a little bit. However, uh, by resecting the arthritis in this area, she had persistent pain relief at one year, and I didn't have to do any type of other ligament reconstruction because she was stable. So I thought about it, and I thought about her thumb uh, thumb MP joint. But again, in this situation, it was just isolated scaphotrapezoid arthritis that was causing her persistent pain that really never she was never better from her initial surgery because it was never addressed. Uh, this is, uh, sorry for the poor quality x-rays here, but this is uh, another uh, case example of a patient who presented after LRTI uh, with significant subsidence of her um, um, metacar um, metacarpal base, as well as hyperextension deformity at, at her MP joint. Uh, what we recommended for her was to um, resuspend uh, the base of the metacarpal with a tightrope, as demonstrated here, and fuse the, the thumb uh, to correct the hyperextension deformity. And again, similarly, uh, she had an excellent result um, of resolution of her pain caused by these two components of her problem. This is a, just an image out of a JHS review uh, by Bobby Shabra, uh, looking at, discussing kind of things you could do for these patients um, after multiple failed operations. And in, in the situation where you think about the, the, the potential causes and you do your tendon suspension and their position, and they may have a lax, soft tissue laxity problem, they fail again. Uh, one, one, one thing I wanted, one kind of technique I wanted to mention to, for these salvage situations 
um, that, that is an option for these patients is a fusion of the thumb metacarpal joint to the index metacarpal uh, base. So take home messages uh, from this uh, brief talk are, if you do encounter a patient uh, and, and, and you will eventually in a, in a busy hand practice, uh, again, as they occur about 3% of patients where they require a procedure, it's important to think about all, all features that could be resulting in their pain and being flexible intraoperatively. So if you encounter, uh, as I mentioned earlier, some scaphotrapezoid arthritis that wasn't evident, or the, um, the joint is more unstable than anticipated based on exam, it's important to be uh, flexible and again, adjust uh, to, to address all of the uh, possible sources of pain to have a successful outcome. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um... I think that uh, we, we treat this uh, pathology so often that, uh, um, you know, I think it's inevitable that we will have patients that, for whatever reason, um, may continue to have pain. Um, and I think that the, um, the common things that you said are the things that um, I think we all think about and uh, just trying to figure out how to manage those. I think it's a little difficult. I had a, one question for you, uh, Joe, and then actually for all the um, when you're evaluating them uh, initially, what is your, uh, what's the role of a diagnostic injection just into like the trapezial void? Um, is that something that you do? Um, does, do you put much stock in it? Any thoughts from yes. anyone in the faculty? Yeah, for, from my standpoint, at least I do think it's important uh, that you're suspecting that their subsidence is causing a problem. Uh, if if, they're, if that, tra that injection doesn't help them even transiently, then they could just be potentially one of those patients with substance without symptoms related to the substance. So it may be, you, you still probably want to address the substance in a revision situation with either, you know, a new ligament reconstruction or uh, some type of artificial material like tightrope or internal brace. But I think you'd be less worried that that was the main contributor to the symptoms if, if, if it wasn't really truly, uh, if they didn't get any relief from that injection. So I do think it's helpful. Okay, Here. yeah. And, uh, I think uh, if you have access to fluoroscopy and you're worried that subsidence is actually causing a lot of the issues or it's, it's impinging upon the scaphoid, letting a patient under fluoroscopy try to do grip maneuvers, you can see how far that can impinge and subside with grip maneuvers. That can be helpful too to see um, if subsidence could be causing a role uh, in some of that pain and impingement. So. Yeah, no, I, I think the utility of the stress uh, fluoroscopy is good. And then, but still the question is, even though they subside in contact between the metacarpal base and the distal scaphoid, um, is that still their source of pain? Because we know that a lot of patients will have probably some contact after, you know, any type of soft tissue procedure. So um, uh I, I agree. I think uh, at least it gives you a, a, a broader picture of potentially that, that being the cause of your pain. Anyone else in the faculty have any thoughts on that? I, uh, I'll tell you one um, maneuver that I like to use to try to evaluate if, if subsidence is their, is their pain generator is just uh, pulling traction, longitudinal traction on their thumb. And sometimes the patient will say, oh my God, it feels so much better. And that, that is a nice technique for me to, to confirm, you know, obviously you have your radiographs as well, but it's a nice co a confirmatory uh, physical exam maneuver. Uh, I find injections helpful, but sometimes it's misleading, right? It's hard to know exactly where the injection's going and, and it's bathing all that entire area. So is it subsidence? Is it an impingement of the thumb to the second metacarpal? Is it uh, impingement of the trapezoid to the sca scaphoid? It could be any one of those three. So, um, but if they do feel better, then I also feel more confident that if I go in there, I can uh, address any one of those three things or, or a combination thereof. Oh, that's great. Um, yes. Um, you know, the, uh, I don't know if this is useful to the faculty, but certainly I hope it's useful to the audience. The one thing that I learned from uh, Dick Eaton was that when you finish your LRTI, that you want to fulfill three criteria, right? You want the metacarpal to be at the same level as the second metacarpal, so the Shenton's line is restored. The first metacarpal lines up with the scaphoid, and the bases of metacarpal one and two do not make contact. So with that being said, Kumar Kadiala and Rich Gelberman, about 30 years ago, had looked at uh, Gelberman's uh, LRTIs. And what they found was 
subsidence of up to three millimeters within the first year is almost a given. So uh, I don't know how uh, all of you look at it, but I don't get unduly panicked by the fact that there is subsidence unless it is accompanied by uh, symptoms. So it'd be interesting to hear what uh, the rest of you have to think about that. Yeah, I have the same approach. I, I tell patients subsidence, actually, we expect subsidence in general. And I think I agree with Dr. Yao and Dr. Miller as far as how they examine patients. For me, I'll have them do a key pinch in clinic and see if we can reproduce the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I also use fluoroscopy to see how much true subsidence, how much axial collapse they have. And that's how I judge how they're doing. A lot of times when I find that, just like Jeff would say, if I pull traction and I stabilize the thumb joint, right. and have them pinch again, a lot of times they feel that the symptoms are better. Yeah. So I think it is a clinical exam. I don't really judge x-rays. So I agree with yeah. you, Dr. Mogul, on that. So. And that's the take-home message, really. Don't get fooled by the x-rays of subsidence, you know? So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's also, like Andrew said, the utility of the uh, fluoroscopy, because uh, when you get a standard PA and not a Roberts view, um, it may look like it's contacting, but really with a, a true um, a PA through the uh what the trapezoid void may actually be just fine. Um, and then we have time for one more question, and I think it's a good one. Re recognizing that unrecognized or progressive uh, scaphoid trapezoid uh, arthritis uh, could be a potential pain generator. Uh, we're just curious, how many of the faculty um, take out uh, the proximal portion of the trapezoid? I and mean, what's your, what's your, uh, uh, threshold to do that or do you ever and just just or never any thoughts i, can I do primarily if, go, go ahead go ahead yeah no i just do primarily if i think um based on my preoperative kind of assessment they do have symptomatic scaphotrapezoid arthritis uh, or stt arthritis so, so i do like and if i do a mid-carpal joint injection in addition to a cmc injection and like, i do it usually independently and if, I, if they get significant relief from their even if it's subtle uh, radiographic STT arthritis, I just have a low threshold uh, to look at that escapo trapezoid joint. If there's anything, anything problematic in there, if they, if they have symptoms consistent with it, I'll just, I would just resect a millimeter. I don't, I don't find any problems with that. Jeff, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, I could share with you. I mean, I, um, I thought about this a lot. Uh, I, I, my, the pendulum swung back and forth in my practice over my career. Uh, I used to have a very low threshold to just lop out a two or three millimeter block of the tra trapezoid. Um, but two things that that I, I'm concerned about. Number one, my my therapists who are great. They they're you know they're they're seeing all my patients. Uh, they routinely say that the patients where I do a partial trapezoid uh, excision routinely take longer to get better than the, just the primary trapeziectomy patients. And it kind of makes sense that that raw bone surface is still there. Uh, it takes time to heal. Number two, I worry about destabilizing completely your scapotrapezial trapezoid ligaments by taking the proximal pole of the trapezoid. So, um, and my partner, Rod Hansen, and, and one of the former Mayo uh, fellows, uh, Shelly Nolan, did a paper where they looked at um, um, all the patients with SCT arthritis and they didn't do anything with the trapezoid and the patients did fine. So. So I used to have a very low threshold. Now I have a relatively high threshold. So unless the joint looks really in bad shape, lots of hibernation, bone on bone, no cartilage left, osteophytes on the distal scaphoid, I'll, I'll leave it. Even if the cartilage is, is worn and very thin uh, between those two bones, I'll, I'll leave the proximal pole of the trapezoid. But I, I'd love to hear what the rest of you do. Yeah. Um... I'll just share my thoughts. I, I agree with you. I, I was initially very aggressive. And then um, I, I do think there's plenty of evidence that shows that um, the, or the STT joint, especially in someone that has pre-dynamic or dynamic instability, um, it could lead to progressive uh, carpal instability. And um, I do worry about that just the same as, you know, patients that have more STT joint arthritis than first CMC. You know, I, I really worry about those patients because I think that arthrosis there is, is probably a byproduct from their instability, and that's, you know, keeping their carpus out to length. Um, but I just, I um, mainly go by, like you said, Jeff, um, seeing how much arthritis there is, and it has to be a decent amount, and also, most importantly, in my pre-op assessment, you know, if I 
palpate the SCT joint right in the snuff box. And that hurts in addition to like whatever CMC grind um, distraction shear type of test, um, then I'll have a lower threshold to um, take out the proximal pull. Um, okay, well, let's move on. We'll have a little bit more time for uh, some case discussions at the end. Um, next is uh, Andrew Miller from Thomas Jefferson uh, University, who's gonna talk to us about the failed SL repair. Great, thanks, Peter. Yeah. Uh, everyone see these slides all right? Uh, let's go full screen. Got it here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the music's not gonna play the entire talk. So, okay. <laughs> uh, so really no disclosures from me on, uh, on this talk. Um, and some of these cases are generously borrowed from uh, partners and colleagues. So if you're like me and uh, Edward Munch is the scream, uh, this is sort of my reaction when I see scapulonate ligament injuries that come into my clinic, especially uh, uh, in younger people that I know I'm going to be fixing. Um, so I'm going to move into some cases I thought that would be helpful and insightful. Uh, the first one I call a whole uh, and still not done in one. Uh, so this is a professional golfer uh, who uh, mishit a bunker shot uh, injured his left wrist, a uh, very acute uh, injury, actually. Actually had pretty good range of motion, uh, about 60% of contralateral grip, uh, positive radial stress tests. Um, he was indicated uh, for scapulonate repair, again, given the chronicity of it was fairly acute. Uh, it was reducible, uh, non-arthritic, joystick, anchors, uh, and pins that were used to secure the repair site. So these are the immediate post-op uh, radiographs. And these are the one-year x-rays. So you can see clear, again, diastasis uh, after the pins came out. Uh, still painful, still not playing golf. So uh, options for this. Uh, well, uh, one thing you could do is uh, try scaphy fusion. Not a very common thing, but uh, he was able to return to golf, 60% of his contralateral motion. Uh, minimal pain, never showed up again. Case two, uh, call this uh, wrestling with a wrestle. Uh, so this is a middle-aged female uh, taken to the OR for scapulonate uh, repair, actually had dorsal SL repair, and uh, excuse me, reconstruction, not repair. Uh, it was reducible, uh, real styloectomy, uh, wrestle screw was placed, uh, day zero. So one month, um, you can see the lateral actually looks fairly good. A uh, little bit of diastasis though, a little bit of gapping even with the screw there. Six months, I think you can start to see the problem here with this uh, screw and the fixation. Uh, things are starting to fall apart a little bit. And then nine months, uh, very painful, swollen, crepitus, uh, pretty much hardware in the joint, uh, not much bone stock left in the scaphoid. So uh, now what do we do? Uh, well, she was indicated for a PRC at one year with an uh, interpositional arthroplasty, uh, and uh, we'll send her to Joe to manage the uh, uh, CMC symptoms uh, later on. So uh, case number three, uh, a gap can get us into trouble. This is a 23-year-old security officer uh, who was in a motor vehicle accident. Um, she came to see me for a second opinion. She actually had a pretty bad hook of the hamate fracture, had volar uh, uh, dislocation of her fifth CMC joint uh, and had a scapulonate injury. You can see the contralateral grip views show some diastasis uh, gapping uh, on that left wrist. She was a couple months out. We ended up taking her for uh, scapulonate uh, reconstruction, uh, went all dorsal. I addressed some of the other symptoms at the time as well. Uh, you know, this is six weeks post-op, painful, stiff. I'm scratching my head. Ooh, I hope she's going to do okay. Fluoroscopy here, three months out, you can see, ooh, she's definitely gapping again, a little dizzy on the, on the lateral. Uh, you know, I thought, well, I'm gonna have to figure out what to do with her. Uh, kind of lost a follow-up for a little bit. Came back to see me actually at a year and a half after the index surgery for her shoulder, was kind of curious asking her, oh, how's, how's the wrist doing? Uh, wrist is no pain. Uh, grip strength, I measured 80% of the contralateral side. Range of motion, pretty good. Uh, plan for her, never get x-rays again and uh, encourage her to avoid hyperextension loading uh, indefinitely with that wrist. 
So case four, uh, this is a, a 360 goes 180. So uh, this is a, a gentleman about 60 years old uh, who had a left wrist injury a few months back. Initial fluoroscopic x-rays here. You don't really see much gapping, uh, you know, some DZ perhaps on the, uh, on the lateral. Uh, it had MRI, CT workup as well from uh, an outside facility uh, that showed some scapulonate uh, uh, ligament injury. Uh, this patient uh, ultimately underwent a scapulonate ligament reconstruction uh, using a 360 technique with palmaris graft. This, these were their intra-op photos. Um, again, it looks like the, you know, the DZ was fairly corrected. You can see the bone tunnels and the scaphoid and the lunate. Uh, they were having some pain before they came back for their first uh, post-op evaluation, it seemed like. Uh, and their first post-op, oof, I don't know what's going on there. It looks like you have a significant uh, VZ deformity now, that lunate, uh, significant gapping instability, um, really significantly painful wrist. So uh, they were taken, um, well, uh, I was going to ask Dr. Ree, uh, nail what, uh, I'm picking on Dr. Ree because I know he's a, a closet horror enthusiast. So, um, but uh, one option, again, a good old PRC for salvage. Um, uh, patient uh, supposedly did fairly well from this um, procedure, uh, but obviously not ideal uh, from the get-go. So uh, are there a good way to tackle uh, SL failures? Um, yes, the answer is uh, really try to avoid operating on scapulonate injuries in the first place. Uh, and the second, the third will follow uh, from our fight club friend. Uh, but you need to have a good strategy. Um, you need to have principled indications. Are you figure out really what you're treating? Um, are you treating pain? Are you treating range of motion, strength, prevention of arthritis? So, you know, Garcia Elias, I think we're all fairly familiar with this algorithm. Uh, really, it's these reducible, uh, normal cartilage type of injuries I think we pay a lot of attention to with uh, respect to reconstruction. Uh, but just because it's reducible or has normal cartilage doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, fixing it or reconstructing is always the right approach. So my takeaways are, uh, for me personally, at least with the SL injuries to start with, uh, if your range of motion and your strength are greater than 60%, uh, roughly two thirds, I, in my, in my hands, I feel like you're probably not going to get a whole lot better. I generally don't operate on, on individuals over 50 with uh, scapulonate ligament injuries. I typically will talk to them more about salvage. Um, I also consider denervations. I found this to be very helpful um, in my practice. I feel like a lot of patients uh, have issues related to pain, or sometimes they'll have more carpal tunnel related issues that can be easily addressed. Uh, and denervations, in my hands at least, have done very well. Uh, especially if pain is a main issue. Um, and always remember primum non nocere, right? Uh, you know, first do no harm. So um, I always think about ways that I'm, you know, can, you know, bail out if I need to. I typically, when I do SLs, I typically go more all dorsal uh, because I feel like in my hands, it's, it's fairly uh, straightforward. Um, when I consider revisions, I often will consider PRCs more so than other options, especially depending on the patient's age. I think once you put a lot of hardware in the lunate and the scaphoid um, uh, and other parts of the carpus, you know, converting that sometimes to like a four corner, I think can actually be a little challenging, especially if you're using headless compression screws, you kind of lose some bone stock. So if I'm doing carpal arthrodesis, I'll probably be more likely to use staples, for example, or do a capital lunate fusion uh, for that. Uh, this is some literature from our uh, Canadian friends up north. Uh, I just thought it was interesting to share um, some of you may have uh, seen this article, uh, very modest improvements in pain scores, uh, grip strengths, functional outcomes uh, from preoperative values when they were looking at reconstruction for chronic uh, scapulonate ligament injuries. Uh, good restoration or at least better grip strength and, and, and improved pain was recorded. Uh, loss of range of motion uh, sort of expected. Their most complications were infection, uh, failures of the graft or the hardware, a little bit of CRPS. Um, our institution published this recently on unplanned reoperations after SL injuries, um, retrospective review. Um, and we found a little over 10% uh, had unplanned reoperations. A lot of this was salvage, which, and the most common ones were revision SL reconstructions, which were more in the minority versus uh, PRCs and, and carpal arthrodesis. But there was really no significant association between the surgical technique choice, whether that was uh, type of reconstruction, uh, use of graft, things like that, 
uh, as well as ultimate outcome. Uh, and, I, and I thought I'd just share this real quickly. I know some people on this call are probably uh, involved in this. Uh, Scott Wolf is uh, heading a lot of this in HSS, a multi-center perspective study looking at all types of reconstructive techniques for the SL and two-year follow-up data, really getting into the nitty-gritty of radiographic evaluation and outcomes data uh, for you know, which techniques ultimately might be the best uh, to approach and the most reliable uh, for these SL injuries. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Great, thanks, Andrew. The um, you know SL injuries are tough, and I think if we let's say we just take SL reconstructions out of, out of the picture, it's just primary SL repairs. Um, I think it, the hardest thing for me is the patient who, um, like your first case, uh, had an injury just a few months. Uh, they have pain and um, uh, a clear SL uh, dissociation. The decision to try to primarily, um, and let's say, I don't know, let's say a month, um, where you think that maybe there may be some tissue, soft tissue that you can repair versus just going straight to reconstruct. The, the hardest thing, because sometimes I go in for both options um, in those acute to subacute settings. Uh, and then uh, I convince myself um, that that dorsal SL looks okay and then try to repair it. Um, and those um, have done well, but many of them have failed as well. You know, my question to the faculty is, um, what are your thoughts on in that scenario, someone that's maybe let's say three to six weeks out from an injury, um, and you're looking at the SL, what tips your, tips your decision to say, I'm gonna just try to repair it, pin it, do all that, or go to reconstruction? Any thoughts? I think, Peter, I'll just I'll say very uh, quickly, I think even if I get people that are fairly acute, which I, I really haven't had too many that are, that are kind of fresh off the boat, uh, from the injuries, I, I still will go in, even if I think I'm going to try to repair it or do something uh, primarily, I will still add some type of reconstructive component, um, sort of like belts and then the suspender approach. Um, I just don't, I just never felt confident. The only times I feel fairly confident are when I get some type of perilunate type injuries um where i actually like you know i'm getting these really fresh you know day or two out and then i realized you know there's there's still adequate tissue and i think some of those can do uh okay for um many reasons but those are the ones that i, I really focus on trying to repair um otherwise i just i haven't had too much luck and i go in with a reconstructive mindset which reconstruction are you employing andrew for reach i i pretty much go uh all dorsal uh uh, internal brace and I use I use it for for graft I don't use tenon graft I use extensor retinaculum because I think it has I think it has like less creep than tendons do so my thought is maybe just gives a little bit more strength as opposed to a tendon where I feel like you get creep and kind of uh, maybe loss of um, that tensioning so and so I kind of have your I have your approach Peter I kind of go in with option a b and c I think if there are if I tell patients six weeks is kind of that window where I think there's even a chance at a repair, I think beyond six weeks, you're looking at a recon or just benign neglect. But I think within six weeks, I go in, maybe a repair, maybe a recon, maybe internal bracing, but I do go in with all three options. I think unless it's a like young, healthy patient, the tissue is oftentimes fairly attenuated, it's stretched out, it's not the best quality. So there's any concern of the quality, I will augment it with some type of tendon graft on there. And with that, it's just a, just a dorsal recon with internal bracing uh it's kind of everything's torn i i think it's the surgery of the month i keep switching what i do for a uh, recon my last two have been 360s kind of a modification of kakar's technique i've been pretty happy with it but honestly i don't have my go-to i just uh i do my best and then send it off to uh jeff Yao if they fail so Well, uh, later on, I have a case about that too. So we can delve a little bit deeper into uh, the recon um, uh, portion of it. Uh, we'll move on to Dr. Yao. He'll talk about the unstable DRUJ after TFCC <clears throat> repair or ulnar styloid uh, fracture. Jeff? Sounds good. Can you um, see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay. 
Awesome. Well, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Chai, and the AO North America for not only putting on this great webinar, but also inviting me uh, um, to participate. It's a humble honor. I really appreciate uh, being able to sit here with you and learn from you all. Um, so I'll talk about the unstable DRJ after you've repaired the TFC or your ulnar styloid. Uh, this is where I'm from. If you have any questions, feel free um, to ask during the chat, of course, but also uh, you can also offline email me. So this is Kleinman's uh, historic um, uh, diagram showing the TFCC, which uh, not only has a, um, a shock absorbing component or the articular disc a load uh, sharing component from the carpus to the ulna, but also more importantly, the stabilizing structures uh, seen here in green and blue, the, uh, the uh, distal radial ulnar ligaments. And so remember the distal radial ulnar ligaments have two components, the deep and the superficial fibers. And so the deep fibers are um, depicted in blue here and the superficial fibers or, or styloid fibers are in uh, green. And this really becomes important uh, later on when we talk about how we treat these injuries. So Andy Palmer uh, initially described the uh, classification for TFCC injuries, and it's mostly stayed uh, uh, or persisted uh, and, and, and um, withstood the test of time. Uh, and for the purpose of this discussion, we'll focus on the uh, Palmer class 1B, where the ligament is uh, avulsed from the ulnar attachment and how do we manage those patients. But it's important to remember that not all peripheral tears are the same. And so Toshi Nakamura and others have uh, really been influential in showing us and demonstrating that, again, we have our uh, superficial fibers as well as our foveal or deep fibers, each of which are important for the stability of the DREJ, but the foveal fibers are more uh, more important. And on MRI, you can see here's a good example of uh, what it would look like where the foveal insertion is disrupted, um, uh, indicative of a tear, whereas the superficial part is still intact. So and Andre Atsai and uh, Ricardo Lucchetti further classified peripheral tears, so further classified Palmer's 1B tears, uh, based on the location of the tear, as well as the uh, involvement uh, or stability and or instability of the, of the DRUJ. So for the most part, we see the majority of patients with ulnar side wrist pain are uh, class one, where it's the distal or superficial fibers which are disrupted. There's a, there's a um, flap of tissue that becomes uh, entrapped within the car between the carpus and the ulna during rotation that causes pain. Uh, that's the majority of the injuries that you'll have. And in the mo for the most part, the DRJ is going to be stable in these patients. And when you have this, there's many different options of treating uh, this, either open, arthroscopic assisted, or uh, more recently, all arthroscopic techniques of doing a capsular repair or repairing the superficial fibers of the TFCC. And the reason we repair this aspect of the TFCC and no other aspect is because of the rich vascularity, which is in the periphery, uh, much like the meniscus. And this, therefore, this area is much, most, much more amenable to healing. Now, if you get up, move on to the more um, uh, severe injuries of the TFCC, uh, anything involving the deep or foveal attachments of the TFCC, then you're looking at situations where your DRJ may be unstable. And this is a different problem. When that is the case, uh, you need to do a foveal repair. Any of those soft tissue capsule repairs are not going to adequately stabilize the DREJ. And there's a number of foveal uh, repairs that have been described as well. And for the most part, these are typically very effective in solving the problem. Now, if it doesn't solve the problem and you continue to have instability or your primary procedures failed, um, then uh, I think uh, probably uh, still withstood the test of time, still the uh, treatment of choice would be a uh, DRJ ligament reconstruction. And, and I, I do like the Adam Berger uh, reconstruction as depicted here. And um, you can even do this arthroscopically as PC Ho has, has shown us. What about the ulnar styloid? Uh, this is in my career gone through, uh, the pendulum has swung back and forth multiple times. And when I was a resident, we never touched the ulnar styloid. When we were, I was a fellow in the 
early years of my practice, I fixed every almost every ulnar styloid because we thought it was involved in DRJ stability. And now we know uh, through papers such as this from the um, from uh, David Ring uh, and others that uh, maybe the ulnar styloid does uh, can be neglected. And here's a, pa um, a cohort of 36 patients. Uh, some of them healed, some of them didn't heal, and they found no difference uh, at six months. Um, so there is a high non-union rate. We know this. Uh, there's limited evidence to support fixing the styloid. After uh, uh, So what I typically do is after I fix my distal radius, I do examine the DREJ. If there's marked DRJ instability, which is rare, but if there is, uh, then my first algorithm is to fix the ulnar styloid if possible, if it's a large enough fragment. If it's not a large enough fragment, then I'll either leave it or even excise it and then do a TFCC repair. Um, splints and supination, and if, if all else fails and it continues to be unstable, then uh, pin the DREJ um, uh, for four weeks with two K-wires. But hopefully, if once you've repaired the TFCC, it should stabilize the DREJ. And again, this is typically very effective. So luckily, uh, fortunately, this is a rare situation where uh, it becomes, uh, it may, uh, continues to be unstable. But let's say, what if the DRJ is still unstable? And I'd like to thank Peter for um, sharing his case with me. This is a case of a 49-year-old female that would demonstrate this concept. Left ulnar side wrist pain five years ago, had a fall, underwent a scope and a peripheral TFCC repair. In an outside facility, uh, still had pain a year after uh, with axial loading, wrist extension, and a form rotation. Here you can see her physical exam. Um, uh, she had an equivocal DREJ instability and pain with palpation of the proximal ulnar lunate. And so Remy Rabinovich and Dave Zalouf had a nice re uh, review paper on what to do with the failed TFCC uh, repair and reconstruction. The first thing is to identify the possible causes, just like uh, we saw with Joe's talk, there's many different uh, potential causes of this pain. Um, and so you want to identify which is which of the following it could be. Number one, a failed initial repair, your initial repair just didn't work. Or uh, you did a capsular repair when it was when it needed a foveal repair. Or you, it did heal, but then uh, the tear um, recurred or you had to re-tear uh, from another injury. Or the patient has concomitant ulnar impaction syndrome. Uh, or it was just simply the wrong pathology, something else altogether, the LT, the ECU, or something else along the ulnar aspect of the wrist. And then lastly, um, there, there's always the potential for secondary gain. So here's uh, Peter's patient. You can see um, there's, there is definitely some dynamic uh, ulnar positive variance. And so potentially this patient had some underappreciated ulnar impaction uh, like uh, uh, um, contribution to their symptoms. Um, MRI uh, as seen there. So uh, what Peter did is he trialed an intraarticular injection, which is what I like to do as well. Um, and uh, the anesthesia did improve the patient's pain. This gave him uh, extra um, um, confidence that the problem was intraarticular. And so the, the diagnosis was the tear uh, was recurrent uh, and it was a foveal tear. Um, the, remember the patient's um, previous treatment was a capsular uh, repair with as well, uh, uh, in, and uh, also concomitant dynamic ulnar carpal impaction. And so uh, before we get to kind of the punchline for that patient, how do we treat the patient with a peripheral TFCC tear in an ulnar positive variant, even in the primary setting, not in a revision setting such as this? What do we do for this patient? Do you treat the TFCC alone? Do you do an ulnar shortening osteotomy alone? Or do you do both at the same time? Well, David Roosh had a nice paper which showed that you could probably just address the TFCC first and see what the how the patient does. And if the patient fails, then go on to an ulnar shortening osteotomy. Basically, they found with a TFCC repair alone or an ulnar shortening osteotomy alone, the patients did well, uh, did fine. So uh, this is the algorithm I, I follow. I usually uh, treat the acute problem first. And if that doesn't solve the problem, then go on in a stage fashion to do an ulnar shortening osteotomy. And I could tell you that it's relatively uncommon that that has to be done. 
This is a study showing uh, supporting the opposite option, which is to just do an ulnar shortening osteotomy, um, which is very common in Asia for one reason or another. Uh, ulnar positive variance is very common in, in the East Asian population. And so in this cohort of patients, they just moved forward uh, in Japan to just do an ulnar shortening osteotomy, and they only did a TFCC repair if the DRJ was still unstable after the ulnar shortening osteotomy, which is relatively uncommon. And so the argument here, the punchline here is that you can treat the TFCC alone, you can do an ulnar shortening osteotomy alone, or you can do both. Uh, but I favor treating the TFCC first. So what did Peter do on his patient? Well, here's some uh, arthroscopy photos showing a little bit of an ulnar impaction lesion on the um, lunate in the middle of the bottom row, and also the fraying of the TFCC on the bottom row right. Uh, and he did a foveal repair. So again, the, the patient previously had a capsular repair. So he did a foveal uh, repair of the TFC and then backed that up with an ulnar shortening osteotomy to, to treat the dynamic ulnar, uh, ulnar impaction syndrome uh, with very nice um, results post-op. So there's a, a, a glut of literature to support doing an ulnar shortening osteotomy if your previous treatment for the TFCC has failed. And, and this is just uh, one of the uh, papers out of Joe's institution in, in uh, Rhode Island uh, and, uh, and others as well. So I like to call the ulnar shortening osteotomy the ultimate bailout. I think it's a common final pathway for obviously ulnar impaction syndrome, but also chronic acute and even refractory TFCC injuries, which uh, is most applicable in this patient. Uh, chronic LT injuries are nicely treated with the normal shortening osteotomy and also potentially disarrays malunions, which is outside the scope of this talk. The results are reliably good. Uh, there are some complications with this, uh, uh, with uh, the diaxial ulnar shortening osteotomies, non-union hardware discomfort, uh, hardware discomfort. So you may consider the metaphyseal ulnar shortening osteotomy in that setting. So I think the teaching points here are you want to consider all causes of persistent ulnar side wrist pain. It could be the ECU, the LT, patients could have secondary gain. Uh, you can have failed initial TFCC treatment. You could have a re-injury of the TFCC. Uh, you could have a primary TFCC injury in the ulnar positive variant patient or a failed TFCC in the ulnar positive variant patient. And so for those patients, uh, I have uh, listed in red here, what my algorithm is, is for the failed initial TFCC treatment, re-repair it, plus or minus a foveal repair if it needs it. And I will not do the ulnar shortening unless the patient's dramatically ulnar positive. I will try the scope part first. And if that fails, then go on to ulnar shortening. Uh, if it's a re-injury, then you same thing, re-repair. Uh, and at that point, particularly in this case where there was clear ulnar positive variance, then I think an ulnar shortening osteotomy is, is warranted. Uh, the primary patient uh, with a uh, TFCC injury in the ulnar positive variant, but no, um, uh, but it's a primary injury. I, I, again, like I said, I address the TFCC first, do the ulnar shortening uh, osteotomy later if needed. And, but in the failed TFCC pathology, then I'll do both the TFCC and the ulnar shortening. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, let's see. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Um, yeah, I think the failed TFCC uh, uh, scenario is really, really tough to treat just because um, there's so much pathology that can happen in like, the area of a quarter. It's um, so many different things. Um, two questions that uh, I was thinking about. Um, the first thing is, um, I've never really treated an LT, so like a Palmer like two, um, a Palmer 2C, where uh, they have the TFC tear, their their ulna is, is, has more variants, or it's, they're more positive, and they have an LT injury. Have you ever seen that scenario where you have to treat LT instability in addition to, say, shortening the ulna? Yeah, I, I, I see that quite uh, frequently, particularly in the ulnar positive variant. I mean, that's um, all the continuum, right? You have your TFCC disruption, you have your ulnar impaction lesions in the lunate and triquetrum, and over time you have attritional wear and uh, potentially a uh, rupture of the LT. And in those situations, it's a slam dunk to just do an ulnar shortening, which will take care of all of those problems. It'll offload the, the lunate, 
it'll uh, tighten the ulnar lunate ligament and ulnar triquetral ligament. So that stabilizes the LT interval and it'll offload the TFCC as well. So for me, that's a slam dunk, um, uh, ulnar shortening in that scenario. So Jeff, I have the trifecta myself. I have all three injuries myself, my right wrist. So uh, when it's time, I might be flying down to a Stanford yeah. surgery for the uh, slam dunk surgery for you. So are you MPL? Come on down. Let's go. <laughs> hey, Chuck, did you did you have a comment, Chuck? Oh, I'm sorry. I somehow came off mute. <laughs> oh, that's OK. I, uh, no, I thought I thought you had some sage wisdom for us. This is a great conversation. I, uh, you know, I think in the setting of ul ulnar positive advance, I, I do like to do an ulnar shortening and a repair. Uh, it, 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 you know, depending on the circumstances and it's, it's interesting. It's easier to do the repair if you do the shortening first, if they're really ulnar, significantly ulnar positive, it makes it a much easier scope. Um, I used to do it the other way, uh, but I do the shortening first. It opens up the space, makes it, makes it a lot easier to do it. That's a, that's a great, uh, lead into my, my other question is that if you're going to do the two, more of a technical question, do you, um, first repair the TFCC fovea and then shorten them and then put stress on your uh, foveal repair potentially, or do you do the opposite? Uh, like Chuck said, any yeah, thoughts? Absolutely. No, that's a great point is that you, you don't want to do your soft tissue procedure and then stress it by doing your, your bony procedure. So I agree with Chuck. I do, I do the shortening first. I, I, I do the scope first just to confirm the pathology. Then I identify my TFCC, I debride it, um, get it ready to re be repaired. And, and let's be honest, most of the time, these are central tears. These are not peripheral tears. Uh, most of the time, it's attritional wear in the center of the articular disc, so you can debride it. But let's say you have a peripheral tear as well. Then I'll visualize it, debride it, get it ready for repair, then open, do my shortening, and then come back and do my, my uh, TFCC repair. Yeah, yeah, I always shorten first as well. I find that I've had quite a few cases going in they have both ulnar carpal impaction, so positive variance, and also DRJ instability. And once I short, the DRJ feels solid. So that's why I always shorten first. I put the scope in there. Also makes the scoping a lot easier. A lot of times when they're ulnar positive, you're trying to kind of get over that hump. It's a lot more challenging. And then like Jeff was saying, they're mostly central tears, but I find that the shortening a lot of times, if I do a good shortening, the DRJ is actually rock solid. You actually end up never having to do a TFCC repair. Oh, interesting. So, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, it makes sense that um, you tension your distal band, the IOM. Uh, maybe it gives you no stability and certainly uh, tightening the extrinsic uh, on a carpal ligaments. Um, so, J Jerry, you're saying that a lot of times in those two pathologies, if you first shorten them, uh, majority of the time, you don't even have to fix the TFCC in your, in your experience. Yeah, so I've had quite a few cases. They're consented for both, and I do the shortening yeah. first. I test kind of intraop on the table, and they once they feel stable, I, I will still scope them. A lot of times, I find that just by doing that, you just end up debriding TFCC tear, just a central tear. Yep. But it actually feels pretty stable, so you don't have to do a full repair or recon. Yeah, that's that's a great point because I like you, uh, like I think everyone else. Um, I I scope and then I actually like in that case I actually do a transosseous. So I, I send my PDS around and before, and I leave it just you know tag with the mosquito and then I'll shorten them and then I'll tension it afterwards. But um, uh, and I test them after my TFCC repair, but I guess I've never tested them again um, after I shorten them and they're in the tower. So that's uh, I'll have to try that next time. Chai, did you have a, a comment? Yeah, you know, um, I like the the flavor of this conversation in the sense that we are trying to solve a problem of a failed repair. But I also want to be cognizant of uh, our audience from across the world, um, from places where resources may not be the same as ours. And I think it is important for us to be cognizant of that. And um, maybe alert them to what natural history we follow before we jump into revision surgery. So Jeff, would you be able to comment on that in a few seconds, please? Uh, in other words, how do you diagnose it? Or how do you, how do you let's say, how long do you wait? What mm -hmm. is your assessment of a failed repair? Why do you repair yeah. in the first place? And you know, stuff like that, because everyone does not have the same resources that we do. 
but uh, given the uh, ubiquity of Zoom, everyone in the world can listen to us. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point. So uh, absolutely, these are these are techniques that we do only after we've definitely confirmed that there there re, uh, remains a problem, right? So, um, so like I, I said earlier, uh, you know, going back to my initial slide, one of my initial slides, you want to identify what the the, the problem is. Um, I don't make I don't pull the trigger on doing any uh, revision surgery until the patient has demonstrated that they've plateaued or heaven forbid they're getting worse um, uh, as time progresses. And so um, and in that situation, in the absence of any new injury, uh, in other words, if the patient says, no, I've never I, I didn't feel any pop or any new injury, then I suspect that the primary uh, treatment has failed. Um, and you know, you can get imaging and things like that, but I think it's pretty reasonable to just, uh, based on clinical exam, particularly if you're resource, um, uh, limited. Um, but, um, if there's a new pop, you know, sometimes a patient says, yeah, I was feeling great. So I went and played racquetball or something. And I felt a pop in my wrist. Then I, then I tend to be a little bit more aggressive because I think that, uh, you know, um, uh, the time is of an essence in that's that scenario. And, and um, I think um, uh, treatment, treatment um, more acutely is, is beneficial. But then lastly, if I see a patient like Peter's where there's only positive variance and, and there's uh, persistent ulnar side wrist pain, you did your arthroscopy and, and you did what you thought the patient needed, the patient still has pain, uh, I think an old shortening I mean, you don't have to do these fancy, fancy jigs that are out there. I mean, you could just use a standard LCDCP plate, do a shortening and then uh, use it on compression mode and, and shorten it that way. So, um, but that, that's kind of my algorithm. Is there a timeline? Is there a, a time span that you play, pay attention to say, you know, I waited nine months, I waited 12 months, I waited 18 months. Is, is there a time limit at which you, you, you know, pull the trigger? After revision or after, or in, in the after primary the index, setting? Index procedure, yeah. Oh, the index procedure. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's some reasonable literature out there to suggest that you just have to wait. And kind of like lateral placondylitis, if you wait long enough, uh, the patient either just f gets fed up and disappears or they just actually just get better. Uh, I have some colleagues from Taiwan who don't operate on TFCC almost ever. They just tell the patient, just wait. Yep. And it'll get better on its own. I, I, I my patients are not that uh, patient, and so um, you know I will certainly try. I start with the period of immobilization. I always cast my patients. I know it sounds uh, strict, but I really just fully immobilize the wrist for four weeks to allow the ligament to potentially heal itself and the synovice to calm down itself. If that fails, uh, we can talk about a steroid injection, MRI, if that confirms the pathology. And the patient's really um, um, not pleased with how they're they're recovering. Then I think there's no reason to necessarily wait. But uh, but uh, that being said, like I said, some people around the world will will just tell the patients to just you know just sit on it and and either it gets better or they just learn to live with it. You know, to me, everything that you just said, the five words that I took out of it was, "My patients are not that patient." <laughs> I think that that hit the nail on the head as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Sorry, yeah. Peter, all yours. <laughs> no, no, thank you. I think um, definitely to everyone else that's um, that's watching. Um, I think most of us would pump the brakes a little bit and be um, a little hesitant and just a tincture of time for sure. But then also um, really evaluate these patients well to make sure you're recognizing any unrecognized pathology or um, you know that you're treating the right thing. Um, so I think those are good points. I think the time, just wanted to say, uh, the time that I would intervene earlier is when they do have instability. Um, in that case, and I feel like they have symptomatic instability, then I will probably more than likely uh, revise that uh, earlier than later. Uh, our, our last speaker is Dr. Jerry Wong, uh, who's going to talk to us about failure of uh, thumb MCP UCL injuries and repairs. All right. Uh, let's see here. All right, thank you. I also want to thank Peter and Chai for the invitation, also the AO North America Education Committee for hosting this webinar. I'm really honored to be part of this. So I've been tasked with talking about thumb UCL repair and recon and complications that can arise from this surgery. 
as we are aware, acute thumb UCL injuries are very common. It's the most second most common ski injury, second to only knee sprains. Your typical mechanism is fall onto a ski pole with your thumb and a forced abduction and extension deformity or um, mechanism. It's really important to note that an acute rupture is very different than a gamekeeper thumb, which is more of a nutritional rupture where you don't really have good substance and good ligament for acute repair. So as we are aware, it's not just from a ski injury, it's a very common injury from both recreational and professional sports with any type of hyper abduction moment to the thumb, whether it's basketball, volleyball, or football. It's also important to recognize that these are oftentimes combined injuries. It's not just the thumb you seal that's evolved off. So you oftentimes have a volar plate injury with thumb MCP joint hyperextension instability and also injury to the joint capsule as well. As far as the pathoanatomy, I think majority of these cases will find you have a direct avulsion off the base of P1. So it's a fairly clean tear where it comes right off the base of P1, but rarely you can't have a missed substance tear. I've had patients with a combination of a distal and a missed substance tear, especially in a high energy mechanism. You can also have a proximal avulsion as well. So during your surgical dissection, it's really important to really tease out that tissue nicely, identify where the tear is coming off of. We're all familiar with the standard lesion where your ECL is now distal or is now superficial to your abductor aponeurosis such that the UCL cannot be cannot heal naturally back to its insertion. Again, it's also important to really distinguish between acute tear, such as from a ski injury, from a sports injury versus a chronic tear where you don't have great substance, great tissue for a key repair of that ligament. Uh, I think suture anchor repair is probably the gold standard for the majority of cases. This is an example where you have a suture anchor placed into the base of P1 with suture anchors uh, placed with direct repair of the ligament, it's insertion back down to the P1 base. This is what you're trying to achieve. This is a patient intraoperatively with a stress test showing obvious laxity over the ulnar aspect of the MCP joint. Now to repair the ligament, you have nice stable construct on stress view, both radially and ulnarly. So case number one, this is a patient by 53 year old female who comes in with pain and instability for about two years now. Interesting enough, she had no history of trauma or injury, but finds that she has extreme difficulty with any pinching or twisting with her right thumb. On examination, you can see from the radiographs there, she has gross deformity of her right thumb MCP joint with radial deviation deformity also hyperextension instability. So these are initial x-rays. So we kind of talked to her about different surgical options and she really wanted to try to retain motion as much as possible and really wanted to have her anatomy restored. So we talked to her about possible UCL repair versus recon. So this is a, a chronic injury with kind of unknown mechanism, unknown chronicity versus an MCP joint fusion. So intraoperatively, we actually found that despite this being two years and really no one event, she had fairly good tissue and we were able to do a key repair of the UCL down to its insertion of the base of P1. Unfortunately, even at two weeks post-op, despite being a splay, you can see that the MCP joint started to sublux radially. So suture anchor is still in place, but that joint's now shifted over radially. Six weeks now, she's got moderate swelling over the MCP joint. MP motion is limited, 10 to 30. And she has fairly severe ulnar laxity with no endpoint. So at this point, again, talked to her about different options. Again, patient's preference was trying to retain MCP motion. So she was consented for a ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction using tendon graft. So a couple of different recon configurations described out there. This is a really nice biomechanical study done by Steve Lee looking at four configuration. Really show that all four configurations can give you stability across the MCP joint, but recon number one is really the only one that restores the flexion extension arc. So if you wanna try and maintain MCP motion, I think configuration one is probably the way to go. So that's what we kind of went with going into the surgery is recon number one. So you're looking at two bone tunnels at the base of P1 in the larger tunnel of the and metacarpal neck. So intraoperatively, the suture anchor was in place, but the UCL is completely torn off distally. Really not the best material that's in there. So probably not a surprise that this was a chronic injury. So we ended up doing convergent bone tunnels with two five drills. 
and pass the Palmier's bone graft, a uh, Palmier's tendon graft through there. A larger drill into the metacarpal neck, it would pull the tendon graft into the bone tunnel uh, over the metacarpal neck region. And this is courtesy of Jeff Yao. Uh, uh, thank you, Jeff, for these uh, slides from a prior talk. This is kind of how I do this. So kind of that configuration one we talked about, Palmieri's graft. I do use a convergent drill guide, which is really helpful. This is Palmieri's. You can see both ends th going through the base of P1. You kind of combine the two tails together and dock it over the metacarpal neck. You could use a biotin adhesive screw, or you could kind of pull it through a bone tunnel going from ulna to radial. This is your final construct. So that's what we ended up doing for this patient. Beware the bone tunnel. Um, I think you should really try and make sure you have at least five millimeters between the two bone tunnels. Make sure you have a convergent bone tunnel on both sides. Uh, I like the convergent drill, but you can certainly do a freehand as well. Once you drill, make sure you use a curette, kind of really irrigate really well. Make sure the two bone tunnels are connected well and clean out again, clean out the tunnel really well with the curette after you're done. This is a patient at two weeks post-op, uh, certainly a lot better as far as the coronal alignment. Felt pretty stable um, at her two week visit. She, uh, three months out, now she comes back. And again, the thumb looks grossly deformed. If you look at the x-rays, it actually doesn't look too bad. But on examination, she has quite a bit of swelling over the ulnar aspect of the thumb MCP joint. It's very, very painful. The thumb's fixed at 20 degrees of flexion. And she has very limited IP motion as well. So unfortunately, this patient went to a, another surgeon, a second opinion. And kind of looking through her chart, she had an MCP joint fusion on that thumb. And then she presented with her left thumb with a very similar presentation, no injury, the ulnar laxity to 50 degrees on stress. Had a recon done by the other surgeon and that continued to be painful, collapsed again. And she had a left thumb MCP fusion on the left side as well. So both sides unfortunately has failed for this patient. I think in the words of uh, Marty Posner in Hand Clinics 1992, the thumb MCP joint is a hinge joint where I think a lot of people argue stability is a lot more important than mobility. So this is a patient that probably at the onset probably would have benefited from MCP joint fusion. This is my partner, Doug Hanno. If you look at his thumb, he really has a, a MCP joint with very little motion. It's almost completely autofused already. So he would make the argument that especially on a chronic UCO injury, probably MCP fusion is probably the way to go. I think along comes uh, Steve Shin, the billion dollar hand surgeon. For those of you who haven't read the article, kind of editorial in the Wall Street Journal talking about the number of professional athletes, really high profile athletes with thumb UCO injuries that did quite well with the repair combined with internal bracing. So you can see Mike Trout, Chris Paul, and Drew Brees on the bottom right panel there. So concept of internal, internal bracing is your thumb UCL is not always the best um, quality, especially in a chronic injury. So you're basically combining a key repair with fiber wire internal bracing. Concept here is you're docking, your insertion into P1, just like you do in a key repair, is supplementing with suture tape or some type of uh, a scaffold to give you a better repair and better stability. So biomechanical studies have been done uh, by Steve Shin and Ty Lee and in their labs showing that looking at a intact UCL compared to repair, compared to recon, certainly a recon and tone bracing is much stronger with better stiffness and better restoration of various and valgus stability. This is a case series of 18 athletes. Not only do you have better repair and better stability, but you can probably rehab them a lot faster so in this case series of 18 patients, 18 athletes, they have returned to play at a mean of 30 days with no failures. So let's look at case number two, 66 year old male. This is a much older male. In this case, you have an acute injury from trying to grab onto a person that was running away. Patient presented about five weeks out from the injury, severe pain deformity over the thumb MCP joint with very obvious laxity and a fair amount of swelling in a palpable mass consistent with the stenter lesion. So intraoperatively, this is actually a missed substance tear. So in a still repairing the distal insertion, it's a missed substance tear kind of over that distal two thirds. We found that there's still enough fibers approximately for a key repair with fiber wire down to P1 base. And I did supplement it with suture tape to give myself better stability and approximately dotted with a three five anchor. 
So this is kind of the technique shown here. So basically you have a, um, some type of anchor distally, you dock the acute repair with the internal bracing that goes across the MCP joint. So unfortunately, you don't always get a great fit. So you do have kind of different drill bits that you use for this, a 3.0 or a 3.5, depending on how much material you're trying to put into the bone tunnel. The goal is your anchor that you put in there should have a really snug fit. So intraoperatively, we actually put in a 3.5 anchor approximately. Love to hear other faculty's thoughts, but we put that 3.5 anchor in there and the anchor pulled right out. So really soft bone, really osteopenic. So the question becomes, you've done your construct. It's nice and secure, secure distally, but approximately you have no bite. You've done your bone tunnels, you dot the anchor in there, there's nothing there. This is where you kind of want to know what your options are out there. You have a 3-5 tunnel, so there is a 4 by 10 tenodesis screw, so this is kind of a good bailout. If you have a tunnel, you can always upsize on your bone tunnel. In this case, you're not really docking in there directly, but you're passing that tendon going from ulnar to radial, kind of pulling it through with the Keith needle and docking and securing it with a 4 by 10 tenodesis screw. And I've also had cases where you've done this and that screw pulls right out. You have no bite approximately, even with the four by 10 screw, even when you upsize the screw, you still have no bite. This is where you can really go old school. So with the bone tunnel, you can actually just pass your tendon graft through and through, and there's kind of tie your sutures either over skin or over a button on the metacarpal neck. So this is in cases where no matter what you do, you can't secure with any type of bio palatinodesis or suture anchor, I think just the old school bone tunnel through and through is a great technique, a great bailout option to keep in mind. Going down to uh, Dr. Hano's advice, why bother with MCP motion? Fusion is the way to go. So last case, case number three, 20 year old male with the injury playing basketball, pain swelling over the MCP joint with ulnar laxity with no endpoint. This case had a primary thumb UCL repair uneventful standard repair with suture anchor. Six weeks post-op, patient came in with a very stable MCP joint, but severe hypersensitivity over the thumb MCP joint, really right over that first dorsal web space of the radial sensory nerve. So diagnosis, this is either a radial sensory nerve irritation, but perhaps intraoperatively, the radial sensory nerve is injured with a neuroma, either a transection of the radial sensory nerve or a neuroma in continuity. Kind of keep in mind when you're doing your approaches, I do tell the resident fellows, this is one case where I want to see the radial sensory nerve on every single case. Usually it's sitting just dorsal to your UCL, so make sure you identify it, make sure you dissect it free, make sure you protect it through in the, throughout the case. Now your options are, I think majority of these cases, I do tell the patients to wait it out. Uh, wait minimum of three months. If their hypersensitivity, their hypersthesia continues to get worse and worse, I will consider an exploration. I think the majority of the cases I've done, which is a pretty low number, it's typically just a lot of scar tissue where your RSN is entrapped in scar tissue, just neurolysis, all you really need to do. But in cases, if you do have a neuroma, I kind of want to give the attendees kind of options out there. If you have a neuroma, I think your options are to excise it and try and bury it just surrounding muscle. You could do RPNI, basically just taking a muscle graft and making a little uh, burrito around the neuroma or you could do re relocation of the nerve stump. So for a RPNI, for attendees that are not familiar with it, it's a pretty easy surgery. You excise the neuroma back to healthy fascicles. You just take a muscle graft. This could be just kind of small piece of muscle, just kind of wrap it around your neuroma ending. And it just kind of provides really a role for the nerve so it's not firing um, indiscriminately. It gives it a job so it doesn't cause neuroma pain. This is a nice little case series by Atherton looking at what you do for a zone three neuroma. In this case series, they had 29 radial sensory, 16 LABC, and a couple of medial cutaneous and posterior cutaneous nerves. In this case, not only did they excise the neuroma, but they actually um, pull it out much more proximal in the forearm and relocate it underneath muscles. And are, in the case of a radial sensory nerve, they recommended actually relocating underneath the brachial radialis muscle essentially do it, doing a TMR much more proximally. And this is kind of just showing the anatomy in there is kind of what you're looking for. This is a radial sensory nerve coming right over the ulnar aspect of the thumb MCP joint. You're trying to reset that and then carry it much more proximally 
in that mid forearm region. They found really good outcomes by doing this. Uh, so you, um, one of my colleagues, Dick Iannuzzi, looked at the UW experience. Over a five-year period, we have 105 cases of thumb UCL repair, 61 acute, 44 chronic. Found that about 25% of patients actually continued to be numb over the incision. About 19% had persistent pain. Neuropraxis, about 8%. So 5% revision rate where the UCL repair actually failed, had to go back for surgery. Kind of important to keep in mind for a patient that comes in with persistent pain that's not unstable. You might want to kind of, we talked about patiently waiting for the patient's symptoms to subside. So I wouldn't jump to doing revision surgery just because the thumb is painful, but rather has to be fairly unstable. Kind of summary, I think thumb UCL is unlike an SL repair. Most of these do very, very well. Uh, with a really high success rate. But if you go in intraoperatively, it's not the best quality tissue. You might want to consider augmentation with internal bracing. If you are doing a recon with a Palmaris graft, I think bone tunnels, make sure you have an adequate bone bridge in between. Be aware of really soft bone. But I think I will argue that if you have to redo your thumb UCL, a thumb MCP fusion is probably much more reliable than trying to reconstruct the thumb UCL ligament. And of course, on your approach, beware the radial sensory nerve. That's all I have. Great, thanks, Jerry. The um, you know, I think the question that I have is, uh, um, you're right. If um, MCP arthrodesis is it's so reliable, um, it's fairly predictable union rates, fairly high union rates, um, and you can really do everything that you need to with your thumb as a post. Um, with the MP fuse, and uh, you know we've learned that from just treating thumb-based arthritis. So I guess my question is, what is your threshold then for those patients that um, have a chronic UCL injury, and you're deciding between recon versus arthrodesis? But there's really minimal arthritis. Uh, have you ever just said to a patient, you know what, the most reliable thing um, would be just to fuse them? Have you ever done that, or yeah, any thoughts on when you would do that? Yeah, it's certainly part of my conversation. I think I also compare their contralateral thumb. If they have a duck handle thumb with no MCP motion, I kind of tell them, look, you really don't need MCP motion. You're probably stuck at zero to 20 anyways. So fusing at 20 degrees, they do quite well. But I kind of have a pretty honest discussion with them that if you want to retain motion, I could do a recon. But a MCP fusion is a one-stage surgery. They're going to do quite well. But most of my patients don't want to lose motion, even though you tell them that, the fusion is much more reliable. They still want to go for that home run. They still want to try and restore their anatomy and retain motion there. Yeah, no, I, I feel the same. Uh, my patients definitely, um, even if you guide them that, um, you know, they won't lose any function or, or minimal function, I guess. Um, yeah, they just the thought of losing a little bit of motion. Um, yeah, it definitely certainly bothers them. And I think trying the soft tissue reconstruction initially, I think, is, is a very good option. Jeff, did you have any comments to add? Uh, it's funny that uh, you present that um, real digital nerve um, neuroma. This is, uh, I remember very vividly, my first complication as an attending 2005 was, was, was uh, a neuroma to the dorsal radial sensory nerve. And it became this huge thing. CRPS was a huge disaster. And, and uh, I, I tell my, so I, Every time I do one of these, I, I always tell a story to my resident or fellow, and, and it's very sensitive to me. But uh, what I find that it's not necessarily even just sewing, you know, you're closing the adductor aponeurosis and, and the nerves out of the way, but sometimes you're using a braided suture. I call it pulling rope through mud. You know, it grabs the soft tissue as it goes, and it often will grab the epineurium of the, of the nerve and pull it right into your repair. If you're not paying attention, you know, at the closure, everybody is chatting. What are you doing this weekend? You know, people's attention is, is off. You really got to treat that nerve with kid gloves. And so, so thanks for, um, uh, for pointing that out, Jerry. Yeah, of course. All right. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to go just a little bit over. Um, there's two cases that I'm going to go through. The first one, I'm just going to go through a little quickly, and the second one, uh, we'll close with that. So I'm just going to show my screen here. All right. Is that full screen? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Uh, oh, boy. 
here we go. So here's a patient uh, who had, uh, who presented to me with a prior APL based uh, suspension plasty, um, the so-called Thompson uh, reconstruction. Um, she uh, was a postal worker and had this chronic uh, thumb-based pain. And you can see on the radiographs that it um, certainly has quite a bit of uh, arthritis there. She had the surgery initially and continued to have pain at six months. Um, they felt that the kind of the tendon mass and the non-absorbable suture on the back of the second metacarpal was causing pain. So they cut that out. Shortly thereafter, she continued to have pain. So they revised her with a revision um, uh, APL suspension plasty. And then she presented to me many uh, a few years down the road with continued thumb-based pain. And on her, um, so this is at her six month post-operative visit uh, from her index surgery. You can see she did subside and I could understand um, the treating surgeon probably did feel like there was quite a bit of, of uh, impingement that was painful. And uh, they tried to retension it, which um, I think is, is challenging. I guess I've never done it before, but I would imagine that'd be a little challenging, but they tried that. Um, and then at two years when she presents, you can see that she um, has subsided. And like Dr. Mudgall had said, I do look at the so-called Shenton line of the uh, metacarpal basis just to see if there is some subsidence. And certainly with a uh, Roberts type of view, uh, you can see that she does impinge. So on her exam, uh, just trying to tease out all those things that Joe talked about, um, I did feel like she had um, metacarpal impingement against the scaphoid. And also when I um, kind of just compressed against her first and second uh, metacarpal basis, she had quite a bit of pain there too and wasn't abnormally ligamentous lax on the other side. And she had you know, really good motion, just a kind of somewhat unstable, um, uh, neo joint at the CMC joint, and uh, I did uh, I did inject her, um, and she did get marginally better during the um, or at least fifty percent better on the anesthetic phase. And so I felt like it was probably the metacarpal impingement. Uh, I could grind her again and it didn't hurt her, so I thought I was on the right track. Um, I'm just going to skip this part because I want to see what everyone else would do. So in surgery, I um, my plan was to resuspend her somehow, um, and then also um, uh, address the ST arthritis if there was there was any there. And on my exam, she was a little tender there as well. But I really didn't have any soft tissue that was um, available. Um, you know, Thompson was initially described as a, a bailout for when you don't have an FCR. Um, and now without really an APL, um, I couldn't do what I wanted to do, which is uh, FCR-based suspension plasty around the APL. I couldn't really do uh, an RTI, really, because of the bone tunnels there. Um, what would what would the faculty have done in this setting where you 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 believe that your pain generator is an as uh, metacarpal scaphoid impingement, uh, but you really don't have any options to revise a suspension plasty or an LRTI? What would you do in this scenario? Anyone? I would do something like uh, internal brace potentially. And that's okay. I always think about if I don't have good tissue, then I'll just use the artificial material. Okay. Yep. So, in like some sort of non biologic um, or maybe augmented with some biology, but certainly the crux of it being non biological, keep it as suspended, maybe put it in some sort of interposition. Any, anyone else? Anyone do anything else? Now she's had two. Two attempted suspension plasties. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't really think an interposition um, really works. Uh, obviously, uh, you can do what, throw a kitchen sink at this, uh, but I think suspension is more important than an interposition. So, uh, full disclosure, I, you know, I, I um, am involved in the whole development of of the tightrope for CMC, but for me, this is a CMC. Um, I mean, sorry, a tightrope. Uh, every day, just uh, any revision. I put a uh, lamina spreader in there to gain my length, um, release all the soft tissues, uh, put a lamina spreader, gain my length, and, and I like to use the tightrope for this. 
Yeah, I do the same as well, Peter. Actually, a question for Jeff. Uh, so you kind of taught us on a mini tie rope, you could over tighten. I found on a revision, I actually go out of my way to over tighten because I always loosen up. So I'm kind of curious what you do for that. And then similar for you, my go-to is our TI, but on a redo like this, I think it's a slam dunk mini tie rope. But patients with Ehlers Danlers or connective tissue disorder, I actually do do mini tie rope as my go-to as well. I love to hear others' thoughts. You know, I think also in this patient, um, I was trying to allude to it that um, she really had contact against a painful contact, it seemed, against her first and second metacarpal basin. I find that um, I do have to revise uh, not a whole lot, but a, a, a more than more than I would think of previously performed many tight ropes where they you know over tension it and then they have contact there that's painful. And so uh, I think it's a good uh, augment in this scenario, but um, I, in her, uh, this is pre-internal brace uh, type of construct. So that's the only option I had with a mini tightrope. And I would I would have done that, but um, I was really hesitant to do that in this case. Um, so what I did was uh, actually like, uh, oh, and then ST, ST joint, she did have arthrosis there, so I took the proximal pull out. And so in this patient, I did like Joe described, I fused her, um, a metacarpal base to the second metacarpal and something that one of my partners Marco Rizzo uh, gave me as a technical pearl is he tries to increase that fusion mass and tries to fuse to the trapezoid as well um, which I did and I was a little you could see I was a little nervous with the the single helix compression screw so I put some temporary percutaneous pins and um, she healed and that certainly helped with her pain um, and she went back to finishing out her career uh, before she retired as a postal worker. Um, I've only done this twice in my career. Um, it's not something I pull out um, very frequently, but I think in, in a patient like this, I think it's a, it's a, um, I think a very viable, reasonable option. Um, any thoughts from the faculty before I close this one out? Looks great, Peter. I think that in the setting of maybe an internal brace um, type of construct, some non-biology with biology, um, I think I, I probably would have tried that. But um, I think this is for people that don't have any of these constructs or suture anchors or whatnot, I think is a really good, uh, useful tool. Uh, okay. All right. Well, uh, uh, time is up, so I'm going to actually... Um, skip my first case. I think everyone, um, thank you very much for sticking around till the end here. I'm going to go to our closing slides here. Okay. Well, you joined us for our uh, third complication uh, series webinar. Uh, join us on May 26 for failures of nerve decompressions uh, led by moderator Jeff Watton. Uh, there are also a uh, few um, AO courses that are available for those of you interested in hand. Um, one is geared towards the hand fellow before they uh, leave into practice or if you're in your first couple years of practice and um, uh, want to just get some extra pearls and tips. It's really targeting um, the new 2B or fresh uh, hand surgeon. And then uh, the advanced upper extremity trauma flap course, uh, it is phenomenal. It's a great hands-on uh, course. So just keep these in mind if you um, are thinking about how to further educate uh, yourself. Uh, and then also we have um, these uh, upcoming uh, webinars uh, in 2022. Uh, so we're really excited to offer these. And then remember that these recordings will be available through YouTube, uh, thanks to AO, Hand, uh, AO North America. So just give us uh, a day or two to get these up onto YouTube. And that's it. Thank you so much to our faculty. I think it was a great discussion and we could have spent so much, so much time on all of these. And I certainly have seen all of these in my patients. And so um, thank you guys for sharing uh, your pearls and how you manage these. Uh, thank you to everyone joining us. Please be safe. And we'll see you uh, in a couple weeks.